Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Hello there, guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Attacking Two podcast with you know your usual hosts, myself, Lawrence Vesely, of course, and you know my fellow co-host, Mr. Jimmy Funnel. And um, yeah, it's just ourselves again today. And Jimmy, how you doing? It's it's been a I've had a good weekend. It was my birthday weekend, I guess. So and I've enjoyed myself. And Chelsea doing all right. Going to Japan now. It's all good. Yeah, I mean things are looking pretty decent. Uh, happy birthday to you again, of course. Uh, you don't look a year older. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> um, it would be time yeah, to start no. looking older now. <laughs> Quite a few developments, a great game against St. Patrick's, and then we've got a lot to talk about today. Exactly. Of course, this will be our last podcast before we take a little break, with Jimmy going on a holiday um, with his fiance. i I'm not sure whether it's actually public that you have a fiance. If it's not, you just have to bleep this um, <laughs> in, in your editing. And um, I'll also be going away for a couple of days, so um, yeah, we'll take a little bit of a break after that. Um, after today's podcast, basically, but, but yeah, obviously, you know, Jimmy did mention the the second our second preseason game against St. Patrick's Athletic um, that we won four 0 on Saturday. So you know, I guess let's start the podcast by talking about that. Obviously, it was again two different formations, two different lineups, and it's just it's very interesting. It's kind of funny to think about you know Frank Lampard in two preseason games has tried more formations than Sadi has over the entirety of last season. <laughs> that is. Quite a good point. I mean, I remember him using the 4-2-4 just at one point, just one game, just uh, yeah. changed things. But that was it. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, we can discuss how exciting it is, you know, 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1. But I thought that 4-2, well, 4-1-2-1-2 diamonds, that was really exciting. We haven't seen that for ages. Two strikers up front was... Yeah. When was the last time? I'm not sure. I mean, Conte, when he tried to throw the sink at uh, whoever we were trailing. But, um, yeah, no, it was interesting. I thought the first half was once again much better than the second one, though. Mm, I agree. Um, I'm just curious to see whether this 4 one 2 one 2 or 4 4 diamond whatever people want to call it, will be a regular thing that we use or whether it's just the thing that we use while we don't have wingers. Because we really only have Pedro and I guess Palmer, but and Kennedy, I know, but that Palmer and Kennedy are not going to be like proper first team wingers, unlike Hudson Lloyd, if he stays, going to get to that. Um, William and obviously Pulisic as well. So I'm going to be interested to see whether we actually use that because, you know, like, like you, I was really like intrigued by it. Like it's not a formation you see used that much these days. Um, so I don't know. It, it was just good to see. I mean, it's always difficult to judge. A you know a formation, a lineup, a tactic yeah. on a game against such a much weaker side than ourselves. I mean, Bohemians were much weaker as well, and we only drew one. All I know that, but you know they're in the Irish league. It's not even a properly professional league. So no, no. just because that formation necessarily did really well against them and looked good and whatever, we don't actually know whether that will be the same in the Premier League. Um, no. But it's just really intriguing and just exciting, I guess, to just find out like that's the exciting new thing i guess that's always what you get with a new manager chelsea fans know better than anyone else um mm. whenever you have a new manager there's always something to be excited about um or worried about i guess um whether it was sorry last season like oh regista and whatever pressing quick passing whatever and now and now it's these new things and it's it's intriguing and the first half i don't know if the lineups perfectly in my head anymore quite frankly because um, i've kind of forgot that we're going to talk about this because it's obviously a few days ago already now um but yeah, we obviously had the four one two one two in the first half. We had um, Caballero in goal. We had Aspi at right back. Uh, no, we had Zapacosta at right back first, didn't we? Zapacosta, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Zapacosta. Luis, Tomori, um, Emerson, Jorginho, Kovacic, M Mason Mount. Um, yeah. Who, of course, did extend you know his stay at Chelsea by five years just yesterday, which was, of course, great news. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, day of recording, two days ago, when you will listen to this, hopefully. Um and then Ross Barkley at, the, I guess, the tip of the diamond, if you will. And then Michelle yeah. Machuay and Tammy Hebram up front. And it was just a really interesting dynamic of the whole thing. First of all, Tammy was a real backup striker to Michi, I felt. I'm not sure whether that just happened to be the dynamic because Michi was more dominant. 
or whether that was actually a set out plan, but that's just the way it came across in the end. Didn't you think so? I think so. I, I, well, the thing is, I always disagree with people that say that uh, Mishibashwa is great at holding up play. Um, he's not bad, but he's not that good. I think Tammy's got the physique and all the attributes that you need for that. And so it makes sense that he'd be the one to link up, play between the midfield and set up something for Bashwai, who, to be fair, set up a lot on his own. You know, I think Tammy was frustrated at times, but Bashwai once again showed, you know, even though he didn't score this game, he's really hungry. He's up for it. He wants to be our first team striker, you know, our first choice striker, sorry. Um, it's very refreshing to see because we haven't been too lucky with strikers recently. And um, I think he's got the right attitude to really be a success next season at Chelsea. Whether we'll see the two striker formation or generally the diamond uh, more often uh, during the course of the season, as you just asked before, it's difficult to say. I think Frank has the flexibility to change things at half time if the game would need it. You know, if we want a game, if we're playing against midfield, uh, which is pretty strong. And you want to overload it because, let's say, their fullbacks aren't pushing up that often uh, and the wingers aren't really threatening as much. And it makes sense to overload the midfield and then break through the centre. We've got the players uh, with enough technique doing so. So, yeah, why not? Uh, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. The only, well, but mainly said the whole like, kind of supporting striker. I, I agree with you. The, the hold-up play is probably better by Tammy. I mean, we haven't really seen him do it that much of it in the Premier League, quite frankly, because Swansea didn't really have that. And, you know, other than that, he's not really played in the Premier, I guess. Um, but it just felt like he was kind of playing it to Bacuay more. Like, if anyone was providing the other one with assists, it was, or with passes, I guess, it was Tammy to Bacuay. And yeah, I think we can all agree that Bacuay's hold-up play isn't the greatest, although to me, at least in those two games so far, it seemed better than when he was first at Chelsea, like before his loan spells, I guess. I don't know. It, it seems a bit better right now. I, I could be wrong about that, but no, it, you're right. against those opponents, it looked a little bit better. We, we would have to know what which instructions were given to him back then and which are uh, given to him by Frank Lampard now, of course. But generally, I can remember the first game of our... I think it was the title winning season under Conte where we were playing against West Ham. We were trailing, if I'm not mistaken. And then in the last second of the game, nearly, Costa shot that low driven uh, shot into the left corner, uh, the bottom left corner. And before that, he'd linked up with Michi Bashwai. I think that Bashwai works really well with two strikers. He can work as a lone striker, you know. I think he did so for Palace, but. Um, and at Dortmund, you know, worked well as well. But I think he really also does flourish in a two-man striker uh, striking system. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think that's one of the more, uh, you know, interesting areas that still doesn't really, you know, we don't have a lot of choices there. I think midfield and uh, defence, there are quite a few more question marks. And as you mentioned him before, Tamori, I thought he was quite composed on the ball, you know, um, it wasn't bad it wasn't bad so I don't know if that's enough to you know displace someone like Christensen or even Antonio Rudiger or who's Kurt Zuma but I thought he was very decent was generally the first team uh, the first half team was just it seemed very very coherent it just worked you know it was all uh, very really flowing. It's just, I don't know. It's difficult to define what the differences, the exact differences were to that second half team, but it just seemed um, as if the chemistry was just going for them. And Mateo Kovacic, wow. Uh, that's one of the players that I've got to say, he did more in those 45 minutes than he did for most of the second half of the season. <laughs> Um, I just didn't really rate him that much anymore. And I think that's just completely because of his positioning. The guy has got technique and I think it was robbed of a bit of confidence. 
Frank Lampard, you'll never get someone who can develop you further as a midfielder uh, that is as good as Frank. So I'm really excited to see Kovacic under Lampard in a more defensive role, maybe, you know, a bit further back in, with either Jorginho or N'Golo Kante. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, just running through the, the players you mentioned, I mean, Tomori is kind of unlucky because we just have so many good centre-backs at the moment. Yeah. Like, you know, in a different situation, he might well, you know, be part of the squad for the season. But with Luis, Rüdiger, Christensen and Kurt Zuma, I just don't see how there's much point in keeping Tomori around. I mean, obviously, we'll get to Ampadu as well. Mm. I guess it wouldn't hurt to have a fifth centre-back around. But just, you know, in case for injuries and then it's easier to rotate so that you can still have, you know, two separate ones for competitions or whatever, even if you have an injury. So I guess there is that. But I get you know if bad comes to worse, you could still put Aspi there. Um, you know, depending on next to who, of course. Um, yeah. I just, if possible, you know, get to more a Premier League loan. I don't think that would be bad, and possibly like if say David Luiz left in like next year or the year after, you know, and then have Tomori, you know, come in and fill that slot. I guess to to an extent that would be possible. And um, yeah, I mean Kovacic, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, obviously the pass for Mount's goal was really. Yeah. Was, Really good ball. Also, great move by Mount to, to get there because, you know, Kovacic might be capable of playing that pass, but last season, quite frankly, we didn't have anyone making that run that Mason Mount did there. Um, because it was rarely Loftus Cheek. Yeah, because it was rarely Loftus Cheek and Kovacic playing. And if anyone would have made that run, it was Loftus Cheek. So it's like, how could Kovacic pass that ball to anyone? Because our striker certainly didn't make that runs. And I guess Hazard at times, but then because he's the winger, if he comes inside, the whole gaps close up because mm. there's more players more centrally then. Um, but I also, I generally thought it was, you know, it's such an interesting formation to me because you don't really have wingers. So I'm, I'm slightly worried if we do it in the Prem against a good team that our fullbacks are completely exposed. Um, yeah. That's why I don't see us using it against any of the top teams ever, quite frankly. <laughs> Because that just seems way too risky. Or you just sacrifice your middle. Because if you tell your wide centre mid to push wide, then the middle is open. So, like, you know, it just doesn't sound like the, the smartest position uh. formation to use against a team that has wide players. Um, but against, you know, I guess lesser positions, I think it could be really good because you can really crowd out that midfield, really put your, you know, your, like footprint on, on the game, put your mark on the game, I guess, and completely take control of it. Not going to say no matter who it is, but to an extent, no matter who it is. And then you have two strikers up front who make it really difficult for any defence to deal with because dealing with one striker is much easier than dealing with two strikers for any defence. Um, and I just thought the the kind of combination we had of Kovacic, Jorginho and Mount was really interesting. Mount was really, like, it seemed like he had a lot of freedom to move. That's how he scored the goal. Well, Barkley was at the tip of the, of the diamond, I guess, mm. had just the same freedom. But it very regularly, Mount ended up way further ahead, you know, way further up the pitch than Barkley, which... They were interchanging, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then Kovacic kind of stayed there and kind of, I guess, played a second playmaker, but just ahead of Kovacic, uh, of Jorginho, if you will. But it was just, I don't know, I really liked it. I also thought Jorginho looked good. Of course, you know, we know Jorginho looks good against teams that are much worse than ourselves. So, you know, you'd expect him to look good against that, um, against, you know, St. Patrick's, quite frankly. Yeah. Uh, but then, as we touched upon, the second half was, you know, not so great anymore. We scored the exact same amount of goals. Of course, it was two and a half time. Emerson scoring the other with a goal that really should never have been a goal with a decent goalkeeper, quite frankly. Um, Still a good shot, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course, it is a good That's shot. That's what I like yeah. about Emerson, goals, you know. Yeah, he's, he's one of those uh, defenders who can, you know, give you a different option. If, let's say, they're packing the penalty box, as was often the case last season, he can just, you know, take a shot from outside the box, which I may not be reckoning with, and score a goal. You know, Emerson's very capable of that. That's why I really rate him. One of the reasons. I mean, yeah, I mean, to be fair, if Alonso can do anything, it's probably score goals. And I'd, I'd argue Alonso has a better shot in him than Emerson. Just, you know, scored a lot of great free kicks and generally good strikes. From but, dead balls, you know, he does yeah. it less. He just does it less. Yeah, he does it less. And from dead balls, I agree. But we haven't really seen him score, you know, from outside the box, if I remember correctly. Yeah, he's I can't... the post about five times from outside the box. True, sure, but he didn't hit, you know, hit the... well, he didn't score the goal, you know. Yeah, yeah, well, you can't blame him for that if you hit the woodwork. Not no, but still, you know, 
what remains, you know, what, what we're left with are the bare stats, the bare facts. And the fact is, Emerson scored the goal. Okay, it was in St. Patrick's, but I'm quite comfortable with him playing there uh, on a permanent basis. Oh, yeah, for sure. And um, doing exactly that, because he also gives us more defensive stability than Alonso. But just to come back to the... the 4-2 or 4-2-1-2-1-2 formation, uh, the diamond. What I really like about it, and I know you're right with uh, the lack of width that we have, that is, of course, a problem, and we could be more prone to counter-attacks if they overload the wings. Um, but what I really, really, really like about this formation is basically the defensive shape that it gives us, because even though if they do come with us, and we are in our shape, we have this dedicated defensive midfielder that stays back, which I don't know. You no, know, Frank said he already knows where he's going to use N'Golo Kante. If he is that, he's one of the best in the world um, at what he does. I know he isn't a DM as such, but I think he would nevertheless flourish in that role. Uh, I wouldn't know who else to play. I think Kovacic could do that also quite well because that isn't as such a register role as we are known. Uh, or as we've known with uh, Sari's 4-3-3. Um, and what we also have is that we have complete control of the midfield. And for me, games are often won in the midfield. You know, if you dominate that area of the park, then it really restricts the opposing team in what they can do. They then have to, you know, go out to the wings, but if you have competent defenders, then they won't really get past there as well, especially if you've got athletic um, midfielders. And Kovacic and Kante, you're not going to get much more athleticism than them. You know, they've got great stamina and um, they can, of course, help out, I don't know, Emerson or Aspilicueta, or hopefully Reese James at some point. Um, so I think that formation, I'd really like Frank Lampard to uh, utilise it more often um, in the course of the season. Even maybe against some some you know of the bigger bigger clubs, you know I think it would work quite well against Arsenal, for example. If you starve them of anything coming, uh, you know, in the middle of the park, they don't have great wingers. You know, they don't have good fullbacks. Then I think you could really dominate them. The same could be said of last season's Man United. I'm not sure how it's going to be if that's going to be the case next season. But I think you, there are some teams that you can generally use that against and it would be a success. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. At the same time, Arsenal really, like especially in that first game at the bridge, like when we beat them 3-2, they really cut us open via the wings, even though they don't have great wingers. So I'm not sure. I know what you mean, but still that's how they cut us open in the end. The only thing I'm not sure about is whether in that formation, Lampard would actually use... Lampard in that uh, Kante in that role because to me Jorginho re kind of did play like a regista in that game it's not necessarily because of the formation maybe it's just because he was in that position but the way we played it and how dominant we were everything ran through him like you know he sprayed it out he kind of dictated do we go straight to the center attacker middle of the striker do I go first to Kovacic or Mount he was kind of like making those decisions and that's kind of what a register is I guess that, you know you can be more extreme about it a bit like Anasari and you can be less extreme about it but I wouldn't be surprised sim simply because of the athleticism that you mentioned also Kante's pace um I wouldn't be surprised if in that formation he would play mm. one of the wide center mids yeah. and you know just a bit like we had in the last game, I guess, with Mount being the more attacking side of the wide centre mids and then Kovacic being the slightly more defensive one of the two. And then if you have Jorginho behind and then Kante as one of the wide ones, and then you have like a Ruben and a, and a Mesa Mount or a Ruben and a yeah. Bob, Ruben and a William, Ruben and a well, uh, Hudson Odoi as the season goes on, of course, um, and everyone's back fit. Um, that wouldn't surprise me, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that Kante can't play in that DM role. I just don't personally yeah. don't see him there, really. I just think we're kind of wasting him a little bit because he has so much pace and he's so good at tackling. Just like, if you play him there, you're kind of forcing him to stay there. Because if he runs away from there, that's just gaps. Yeah, but the thing is, if you get past them, that person, that, uh, that screen of the defence, then the defenders behind them, because of the way this system plays and the reliance on the fullbacks to push up and give even more um, 
you know, attacking impetus over the wings because there are no wingers, uh, no designated ones, then you need someone who's really, really fast at tracking back, who can really recover well, and that's N'Golo Kante. I really love Jorginho. I've said it oh, yeah, often but enough. But the thing is, uh, why he was in the Regis in that St. Patrick's game, we just had the ball the whole time. And, you know, even if he would play as one of the wider, wide, well, we don't know, you know, how we were playing that game. We don't know yet. It's just against two Irish pub teams with all the respect to them. Ooh, so yeah. we have to wait and see. And I think Jorginho, you know, if he goes, as you mentioned, Mountain Barkley, they interchange that front. The same can be the case with uh, Jorginho coming back, you know, and working together with Rock Kante. That's, you know, that doesn't mean that that can't happen. And then move forward, he's got a great passing array, even though there are some morons that say that isn't the case. So uh, I think that would work just as well with Jorginho a bit further forward. But, you know, time will tell. One thing is for sure, and I'd really like to hear your mind on this, um, is I think... For the person that attacking midfield, that ten basically it's a ten behind the two strikers in that system. I think why Mount changed interchanged more often than not with Barkley is that Barkley just hasn't got that incisiveness when it comes to his passing. You know he was good in that game undoubtedly, but he doesn't really give you those killer passes that you need in that position. Or let's say if you do have those killer passes in that position, as Mount showed on a few occasions you know, the opposing defence has big problems. Mm. So I think using Mount there before Barkley and then when Ruben Loftus-Cheek comes back, him there, he has to be our first choice of last me because uh, he can do that just as much. That would work. What, what do you think? Yeah. <clears throat> should Barkley be used at the top of that diamond? Barkley should be used at all, <laughs> quite frankly. Uh, but... Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, no. Mount, if he is to play, I would I probably prefer him most in that position, even though for the most, at least in his dog, because at Derby, <laughs> Lampard didn't really use a number 10, so he kind of played as an attacking eight at Derby, and kind of the wide centre mid in that 4 one 2 one 2 is kind of an eight, I guess. So it's kind of possibly what he's more used to, but I don't know, it just seems slightly more suited to the 10. But if we were to use that formation, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the wingers play that position, whether it's Hudson Lowe, whether it's Pulisic. If we don't start wingers, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the wingers started at the 10. Um, and then mm-hmm. like you just don't have Barkley in there and you have Mount on one side or Ruben yeah. on one side and then you have the Jorginho Kante or the Kovacic Kante or whatever um, in the team. So that, that wouldn't surprise me. But yeah, I'd rather Mount there than Barkley if, if, that, if that's your main question. I'd rather Mount there than Barkley. Yeah. But because Barkley, not just it doesn't have the passing, but he just also didn't have the like the darting movement that I think is really mm-hmm. important in that position because in that formation. Because when you don't have wingers, one of the strikers is always very likely to move out wide to receive the ball or whatever yeah. because you know the fullbacks can't always be the, all the way forward. So, um, the, you know, one of the strikers does tend to push out wide. And then you kind of need the 10 to kind of fill that gap. And then you need the kind of one of the midfielders to kind of fill the 10 gap, I guess. And then kind of shape, move it around into a kind of two holders and then a 10 and a strike and then one wing, I guess, in a sort of weird, like, you know, uh, fluid way, if, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't have that. It just doesn't have that movement. I mean, once he gets on the ball, he's all right. As long as he doesn't try to pass it to someone. <laughs> um, but... That's a major issue in the game of football. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To be fair, he did assist Emerson's goal. So what can I say? Um, yeah, he's not going to have easier passes than that. That's the only thing. Yeah, it's like someone um, said he assisted by twice goal in the first game. I'm like, great, he shot at him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I think. Uh, yeah, I think one of the major issues here is whether we have the stamina, the the physical capacity to do it. I know some of them, like Kante, do have this undoubtedly, but. You know, that system, especially of, of the fullbacks, they need to be running up and down, up and down. And, you know, if we do get, get caught out, they have to dart back immediately. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I, I love Emerson. Whether he'd be able to do that for 90 minutes, I don't know. Who I know for sure that that won't work is Cesar Azpilicueta because he's just, you know, it's his nature to stay a bit more back. He, 
he isn't an attacking. And he will do the running all right, but he won't, won't get forward as much as we might want him. Yeah, but he will back all right. So yeah, that will be interesting with Reese James. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, in in a formation like that, you you saw it last last year often as well. Like when the fullback pushed forward, it's often the wide midfielder that just pushed back to kind of cover. So it's like in that four one two one two. In you know the the formation that we had in the game was like yeah. Kovacic and Mount would like push back and kind of the fullbacks would come in to cover that role until they can swap it round again just yeah. so less distance has to be covered. Um, but I think we've already spoken way too much about that first half considering how long we want this podcast to be. Um, so we should sure. probably get a little move on because we still have to, other things to talk about because the second half wasn't that good. Going back to four two three one, I'm still not a fan of the four two three one. Yeah. But Olivier Giroud looked really good. When he scored the two goals, other than that, he didn't. But when he scored those two goals, it was a madness. All right, it was still St. Patrick's countdown now. No, no, I just can't believe that coming out of your mouth. Oof, bloody hell, you know. Yeah, but that, that second goal, like, you know, I tweeted it as well. You can't not rate that. Like, I don't care who it is against, if you have to physique that he does to score that goal, fair play. Like, I can't say anything about that. Oh, yeah, by the way, I forgot to say it at the start. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and the iTunes and to follow us on Spotify and listen on all of the platforms. And also our social media links are down in the description. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, follow us there. I forgot. That was my job. I bought it. Um, but, yeah, Subtle, I mean, Lauren. Subtle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> no, you just have to be honest with the viewers, isn't it? When you just forgot, you forgot. Um, but... You know, obviously the, the second half lineup. Let me just think it through because we had Aspie at, the, at right back then. Um, obviously, it was Jamie coming and goal, but the goalkeeper really didn't make a difference. Although I still don't know why Kepa didn't play. Quite frankly, um, I mean, maybe it was just Frank knows anyway that he's going to be the starter, so doesn't really need to play in the, against a, an Irish uh-huh. team. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's something like that, and he just wants to figure out who wants to be his second choice. Is it coming? Is it Caballero? I guess maybe it's something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah. The two centre backs then were. Christensen and Kurt Zuma. At left back, it was Marcus Alonso. Clear difference to Emerson, again. Um, you know, just how secure we were on the ball down the left-hand side. Um, a holding mid two, I guess, of Billy Gilmer and Bakayoko. And number 10 of Casey Palmer. On the right was Pedro, who again was dreadful. I know he's Pedro and he'll be all right by the time the season starts. But no one really mentioned it, but he was awful in both games so far. Um Kennedy started on the left, and then obviously Olivier Giroud, like we said, started up front. Oh, I say started, but played the second half up front. Mm. Um, I mean, do you just want to quickly say something about Pedro? Am I the only one that thinks he was awful? I just think um, no one's mentioned him. You know, the thing with Pedro is there's not really much point criticising him anymore, because I've said it often enough last season, Pedro and William, the wrong side of 30, they're in decline nowadays. I know William wasn't bad at the Copa America, but still, you know, we need new wingers next, next summer. Yeah. whatever happens. So the thing is, somehow, because Pedro's just got these bundles of experience, he will come good in the season. He'll score a few goals, maybe even a few clutch goals. He has scored some very, very important goals for us over the years. Very um, good goals. Well, very good goals, yes, very much so. So I think he'll be fine. Um, so I don't, I don't really have much to say on that. I think Kennedy, he did well for that, you know, that loved cross in. Uh, from the edge of the penalty box to Olivier Giroud to set him up for the first, I think it was the first goal. Yeah, first goal um, in the second half, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, the first goal in the second half. Uh, you know, he's got ability, Kennedy. He, I think he did his last Elastico trick there once again or he was in the first game. He's got ability, but he's just not able to show it consistently. Yeah. So, I think he'd be more worried about him. I don't think he's going to stay. Yeah. If there's one thing that I really want to say once again about that second half is the contrast between Billy Gilman and Timo Bakayoko. Billy Gilman immediately, once again, he made an impact. He, he did, you know, lose that influence over the you know, in the course of the second half. But, you know, he's eight, 17 years old. Uh, he's, he's already incredible what he's showing. And Timo Bakayoko... I've had a hard long think about it, and I think we're well and truly. Well, actually, with Ampadu going now, I'm not sure any more, but um, I think we'd be well and truly set without both of them. You know, his pass into the out, I know it's pre season, but Jesus Christ, that was just atrocious. I, I don't know what to say. This is as if he's, you know, he's got confidence wherever else he is, but at Chelsea, the same with Alvaro Morata, who came in the same summer. 
as if they're cursed. They just lose any confidence when they're on the field in the Chelsea shirt. And it's ridiculous. I don't know. Uh, that was the main thing that I remember from the second half, so it's not something good. And I think, as I already said, we were just not as... Um, uh, it wasn't as free-flowing. Yeah, we weren't uh, as good at anything, really. Except... Giroud, quite frankly. Yeah, no, no, that's why. Him, oh. him scoring the two goals. We didn't. We also didn't really have that many more chances than those. Two. One in the first half, we had loads. Yeah, so, you know, Bachoy hit the post, uh, hit the bar. Barkley hit the post. Bachoy had a couple of decent shots saved. To be honest, he possibly should have done a bit better with a couple of those, but still got himself into good positions and you know, decent movement. The only thing, I, going back to the first half, sorry, mm-hmm. he got a bit selfish once he didn't score. That part I didn't like, but that's just what. I think it's just he really badly wants to be the first choice. So that's why I got a bit selfish. I think that's no problem. Do that in preseason, fine. If you do that too much in you know competitive yeah. game, not fine. Um, but yeah, the second half, like you said, of course, the Billy Gilmer and Bakayoko thing, certainly a thing. And um, I think we're going to get to the Ampadu thing in a minute because the likes of Drinkwater and Bakayoko is why I don't get it. That's why I don't get it. I'm like, I know that Ampadu could do Basically, let's just throw it out there. Frank Lampard today in his press conference said um, this morning that Ampadu didn't make the trip to Japan. Obviously, he didn't because he will likely go out on loan. And um, Lampard likes him, he said. He wanted him on loan at Derby. We all know that. And he actually wanted to work with him this season. But for his development, for the players' development, the, basically, it has been decided that it's probably better for him to go out on loan. Hopefully, to a Premier League club. Um, but when I then see the Bakayoko thing, when I see Drinkwater, just his existence annoys me. <laughs> um, and then we have to loan out Ampadu. I'm like, I mean, sh- surely one of Bakio can drink water has to stay. Probably drink water just because he's English. Um, because I doubt we'll get rid of Ampadu, drink water and Bakio. I just can't, don't see that happening. Um, so yeah. especially, like maybe in January, we'll get rid of another one once Ruben is back. But until Ruben is back, we kind of need the numbers as well. Yeah. Um, so, that, like I say, that's why I don't fully understand it. Drinkwater had this weird moment where he just, I don't know, was kind of escorted from training. And that was, was awesome. weird, yeah. yeah. And then he was just not involved in the second game, but apparently without being injured. So, that is weird. But then why is he on the way to Japan? <laughs> like, why he didn't was... look very happy, did he? If yeah, you saw that exactly. Instagram post. Exactly. It's just, it's all very, very strange to me, quite frankly. But, mm. yeah. Bakayoko didn't look great. I mean, I, pu- I put a, a thread out about that on Twitter. I'm like, I don't need him to be good against that kind of team. I don't need him to be particularly great on the ball. What I need Bakayoko to be, if he stays, is to be the guy that I bring on with 15 or 10 minutes to go when we are 1-0 up in a tight game and I just put him there and he wins every header and he just clears the ball. That's what I need him to do. You know, whether he is capable of doing that is a different question, but he certainly has the body type to do it. I don't need him to be a great pass off the ball. I don't need him to be a great dribbler. Mm-hmm. And I think because we don't have anyone defensive except Kante, especially with Ampadu leaving, I think that's why Baki, keeping Bakayoko for that role, just to, because I think it's an important role to have in the squad. It's one of them where you're like, why is Bakayoko always on the bench but never starts when someone else isn't on the bench, either starts or is, you know, completely on the stand? on the stand not understand <laughs> um because he's just like just in case we need him we'll just have him on the bench probably not even going to bring him on but just in case that's what Bakayoko could be and now with Ampadu going out and loan should be but Ampadu could be that just better um, I, I know and that's something that's kind of uh making me question is it that decision you know you know, the, the thing is, people say I need to load. Why? My philosophy in regards to young players is either you've got it or you haven't. There are some players that do need loans. Yeah, I agree. But then there are these generational talents, and I, I don't care what people say. Yeah, it's too early. Ampadu, for me, shows the maturity of a 27-year-old. The guy doesn't need a loan. He can play at Chelsea immediately. If, if let's say... We have an injury crisis and he have to start every game. I wouldn't have a problem with that. He's the only youth player I wouldn't have a problem with, yeah, but even before Hudson Odoi or anyone. You know, this guy has got the composure, the maturity, the physicality to play well, at least in midfield, centre back, we'd have to see. That's why he can play in both positions. I wouldn't send him out. I'd sell back Yako and drink water or loan them out, whatever, and and keep Ampadu. You know, he doesn't need a loan. 
he I, I get that he needs playing time, but I think at his age of, you know, he's only 18 years old, it'd be just as much okay to, you know, stay with Frank, develop as a player, watch his comrades, you know, the veterans, give, gain experience there. And then if he really isn't playing anything, loan him out in January. I don't, I'm not, I'm not happy about him being loaned out. I really am not. I, that, that's my, my view on, on Ampadu. I mean, I get where you're coming from with the whole, like the playing thing, but that's the thing. I mean, I completely agree. If we had an injury crisis and he had to play and he had to play fine, completely fine. But then let's hope that we don't have an injury crisis. And then if we don't, then he doesn't play. Like, because, okay, we did play this 4 one 2 one 2 now. But how likely is it that we're actually going to use that regularly? Probably not that likely. So you don't need four midfielders every game. You need three. Maybe even two, because he's definitely not a 10. So he's fighting for one or two positions. So it's like, well, then you're kind of struggling to get him the game something that he should probably get. But I will be just as triggered as you are if he doesn't get a decent Premier League loan. If we send him to the Championship, I'm, I'm, I'm flipping out. Like, I'm like, what the point in that? He's just going to get worse there because he's not going to learn what he needs to learn. Like, I know Mason Mount did all right, but Mason Mount was with the same manager that he is with now. Like, you know, there's a reason why Bacuai yeah. is looking quite a lot better than Tammy Abraham, right? Because he's coming from the Championship. Give Tammy Abraham a bit of time, he'll look all right. But it's a completely different ball game coming from the Championship mm. to playing for Chelsea. It's a completely different story. So if he gets a Premier League loan from a team that finished somewhere between 10th and 15th, great. Perfect. I'm very happy with that. If he gets a Premier League loan from someone who finished 16th to 20th, or, well, or the promoted sides, depending on the promoter team, not that happy because then it's going to be another Swansea and you're like, mm. right, you're just not learning anything that you actually need to know with us because you're just always defending. <laughs> so you don't actually learn the way we need to play or we need you to play when you come back. Um, yeah, so, but don't you, know, you think that it depends? I mean, as said, he, uh, Ethan Ampadu, as is with Reese James, I think Wigan was constantly fighting for relegation yet he was still the star player the whole oh, yeah, season yeah. long. So I think even if he would go to a team which isn't playing too well in the Championship, he'd thrive nevertheless. Oh, yeah, yeah. I agree with you, though, that a Premier League loan would be great. However, I can't really think of... I, I've really tried to think before we were recording today where I'd send Ethan Nampadu. People are saying Aston Villa. They have just bought Tyrone Mings. They've got Chester... Those are the starting centre backs. Of course, there can be an injury, but those are the starting well, centre backs. In They're midfield. not in midfield. That will be a possibility. They've got Majin there, uh, Mitchin, sorry, uh, and uh, Grelish. So there is an open spot. However, they've also got Lansbury and a few others. I think Lampard is better. There, fair play. <laughs> sorry. Impressive Aston Villa knowledge there, fair play. Well, they've got a few. You know, I watched them a few times because of Terry and Tammy last season, and they've got a few options in midfield uh, so he would probably play in midfield there if it, you know he, he does come to him leaving for Aston Villa but... I'd want him to be a midfielder long term so that's why whatever we loan him I hope that he plays in midfield mm. um, but yeah I mean I, I get your point uh, uh, you know there's there's no one I mean Bournemouth the people say they've got a centre-back pairing uh, Norwich even they've got a centre-back pairing and they you know they just got promoted <sighs> There's not a lot of options there in the Premier League right now. That's the worrying I thing mean, where, you know, so it will be the championship. Uh, I mean, you, uh, to me, you can think a bit further ahead than that. Like there is, you know, we we spoke about him just now, him being completely fine to start in the Premier League. So arguably, he will start over most of those players that these teams have. You know, you could argue that. I mean, I, I can't think of all of the teams course. now, but... You know, you could start him next to Milivojevic at Crystal Palace. Like, I, I think he'd be just fine in there next to him in that holding mid. Like, and probably play over whoever else they have. Is MacArthur still playing? Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, but no. Well, I think he's more of a, a you know an impact player from the bench. But the thing is, in the Premier League, it's all about you know competition, and they know Chelsea isn't. You know, there's no chance in hell that we're going to sell him or give them an option to buy. So we've often had this problem that they won't play him as much. They won't trust him as much because they know where he's going to be gone soon. That's the problem, you know, and I wouldn't trust just, you know, John Terry's there. Don't worry, he'll play. He's not the manager like Frank was, you know, and even the assistant manager there was a Chelsea boy, you know, Jody Morris. 
Mm. You know, he's also not always gotten along with the manager Dennis. if he doesn't start Ampadu. Um, <laughs> Sorry? He would probably just slap the manager if he doesn't start Ampadu. Um, yeah, we well, keep then, forgetting then, Aston Villa's manager's name. That's why I called him Dean, I think it's Dean Smith, if I'm not mistaken. And Dean, the thing yeah. is that they've also you know, come together a few times. I don't think that would end well. So uh, yeah. if he goes to Aston Villa, fine. Fair play. I think that'll be a good loan. But if he gets a chance, why not look outside of England, work for Christensen? Why not? You know, German Bundesliga, other. The only problem is they'll try and snatch him up because they're our miserable, miserable bastards over there who then just tap up players publicly. That's why I don't actually want us to send any more players to Germany. Sad state of affairs, but that's just yeah, the way it is. There's no point sending him to Spain or Italy because that's just too different. And then France is just dead unless you're PSG or Lyon, I guess. Mm. Um, Lyon, yeah, I'd be nice as a destination. Actually. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So. So, I still think he can get a Premier loan. Of course, you make a fair point with the whole problem of will they play him enough because they know he'll be gone at the end of the season. That's why you tend to give them to, you know, promoted teams such as, or not, or relegation fighting teams such as Tammy Everett was at Swansea because he did play every game, just that Swansea were really bad, (laughs) but he still played every game. Um, So, yeah, those things, of course, come into I mean, Billy Gilmer was one of the guys that didn't travel to Japan. I think that they actually tried to still get the visa sorted and take him. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah, But it just wasn't happening in time. Like, to be honest, he's never going to be like a regular this season. Whether he goes out alone, which I don't think he will, he will probably have played mostly in the under 21s, played a youth cup, the UEFA youth cup, and that kind of thing. So, whether he now goes to Japan, yes, it would have been good, I'm sure, for his development as well and his experience. But, you know, it's not going to be the, you know, the be and end of, like, of, of anyone Size or anything. Two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Agreed, um, yeah. But unless you have anything else to mention about the St. Patrick's game, I mean, Casey Palmer, because you said you don't think Kennedy will stay. I think one of Kennedy or Palmer will have to stay because, you know, I guess we'll kind of need four wingers until Hudson Doyle is back. Well, the thing is, I don't think that Hudson Doyle will be out for that long. I think... End of all this, we can reckon with him. Yeah, I think he's he's definitely going to stay. He's not. There's not no chance he's leaving. I just don't know if he's going to sign that contract. Nizar Kinsella, I think you saw that as well on Twitter, said you know he's going to sign that contract, and I'm still actually still very confident. And I, I don't get all the outrage and slander that's been going his way. People are saying he's a snake. Oh, sometimes I really hate our fan base because there are so reactionary idiots out there. He's still a Chelsea player. There's been no official confirmation that he doesn't want to uh, stay. No, right. he's no, been no, no, here no. for Hold on, hold on. Del, if he wanted to stay really badly, he would have signed that long contract a long, long time ago, right? We don't know the yeah, contract course, details. Course. We don't know where, you know, what, what it's, uh, you know, what we're waiting on. Maybe it's a, a minor detail, which, you know, one of the camps still wants to adjust and the other one isn't budging and they're just taking the time. Also, as uh, Terry, Terry Sarzo, who was our uh, guest last uh, last week, said quite accurately on Twitter, it's all about timing this summer because we haven't got any transfers. So they are trying to time things. It was quite a big gap between Kovacic and Lampard coming in, then the Ruben Loftus cheek being announced, then Mason Mount being announced. Give it time. We don't have any hassle right now why you know is, is, is this so just give it time and i think he will stay uh ultimately um but well, i mean you said a minute ago yourself you're not sure whether he will sign the contract no okay let me say this. of course i can't know for sure but i'm fairly confident that he will my my intuition says that he will but of course i can't know that he will sign it for sure um but, sorry, what was the initial point of discussion that we were talking about? Kennedy and Palmer. Stay yeah. One of yeah. Them. So last thing I wanted to say on that St. Patrick's game is that the second half we saw that if the midfield isn't good, then that system is completely, you know, for nothing. You know? And our midfield wasn't as good, even though Gilmer showed, you know, some signs of brilliance um, as our first half team. And that was the deciding, decisive uh Difference. I know it was a different formation, but generally those where you have more midfielders, three or so, or three or more, you need good midfielders. And Palmer isn't Chelsea standard. I'm sorry, you know, he seems a decent guy, but I don't think he's good enough. Mm-hmm. Bakayoko is pretty evident that he isn't good enough. So I have to wait and see. If I'd tell me who you'd rather have, but for me, it'd be Kennedy. 
You know, he can also play at left back if needs be. He, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let him go. But yeah, if Hudson thought, Doy comes out sooner, then we, we'd have yeah, four wins. I mean, I, I thought Palmer was quite a bit better in this game now than he was in the previous game against Bohemians. But yeah, you'd have to argue with the experience of playing in the Premier League, even if it for the last six months wasn't that much. You just have to take Kennedy just for all of those things combined. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now getting on to the Hudson Odoi thing, because obviously I just recorded a video talking about this on my own channel as well. And I completely agree that he will probably sign that deal. And of course, we never know exactly what is going on. We know quite a lot of things. You know, I know you and I know quite a lot of things, whether we're told things, whether we read things, you know, do more research than people that just know BBC News and Sky Sports. You know, there is things that are going on. If For me personally, right, I was very annoyed with that transfer request. I know some people took it lighter than others. I was very annoyed. I, I wasn't having that at all. And, um, you know, that, that's just me. I just didn't appreciate it one bit. So, But if you think back to it, so he's had since December really to properly make his mind up whether he wants to stay or not. And, you know, it's it's not like it's impossible. If there's only a minor thing to sort out in a contract and he sees all the hate and everyone is so worried about him leaving because of the hate, first of all, that hate is completely self-inflicted, right? Because he didn't need to hand in that front transfer request. So, you know, that's... Self-inflicted, that's... No, no, no it is. can't say no, self-inflicted. No, in my opinion, it is. You don't have to hand in that transfer request and then none of the hate starts. So, right, end of, to me. Yeah. You have to you have to put things into context. He didn't know if he'd have the future. He, there was no precedence that would show him he will actually be playing long term at Chelsea under Sari because let's face it, he wasn't being utilized as often as one would have expected after such a great preseason. He is overconfident, which isn't a bad thing, but of course, if he's saying, Yeah, I'm as good as Hazard and that's why I deserve to play, that is of course something that is a bit worrying, shades of Masanda and all that. But I, I wouldn't say it's self-inflicted and look because at there is the... never, there is never reason to verbally insult oh, no, no. and slur a player right. as, as that. So, no, I don't think it's self-inflicted. That is just moronic nature of some okay. people on Twitter. I, but, I um, when, when, I, when I say hate, sorry, just, just interject, just to clarify what I said. When I say hate, I don't mean the people that insult him and you know, to do these stupid things. I'm like, all right, calm down. He still plays for us. Even if he didn't play for us, he's a bloody human being. Like, there's no point, no need for any of that. Like, whether he's a Chelsea player or anyone else. But even more so, if you're a Chelsea fan, towards a Chelsea player. But, you know, when I say hate, it's like discontent like I show. You know, I don't yeah. insult him or anything. I'm just like, I'm annoyed because you're handing a transfer request and you've been offered 100 grand a week. You've been offered the number 10 shirt and you've been promised minutes. We can't do more right now because you're injured. We can't play you while you're injured right now. So stop holding us ransom and sign a co goddamn contract because if you're only back after the transfer window, maybe we want to sell you. So maybe make your bloody mind up and don't change your mind more than your pants. Two, two points in that. First of all, they're taking it easy on both sides apparently because he is currently injured. Second of all, he will have waited until the official confirmation of Frank Lampard being our manager will have come. So saying he's had since December, from December until May, he will not have clarity about will the club go in that direction that they will use youth. So that has to be put in context. OK, well, so it's not no, as because, if he's had that no, much time. It's relevant for him youth or not, because with Hazard leaving, whether it was sorry or not, he would have been a regular player. So oh, really, whether it's Sari or, or Lampard, like we had the reports that like irrelevant of who is the manager, we had this report in a, a report in April that he will sign a new contract. You know what, how reliable those reports are. You can never be sure. I know, but it doesn't really matter whether you have Lampard or Sari when we only have three wingers, four wingers with Pulisic, that he's eventually going to play over William and Pedro. When even Sari already played him over William and Pedro as the season went on. That kind of that that argument really doesn't count for me, really, because even Sari played him over them. So yeah, whether it's Sari or Lampard, really doesn't that, we don't know if that wasn't told to him by the club, you know, because it did seem that way that it was insinuated. Now we're taking him because he put in the transfer request. Suddenly everything was done by both the press secretary and by Sari to keep him and to show him we're putting faith in you. And even then, I think it was just already Sari wasn't, you know, we liked Sari, yeah, you know, we wanted him to stay, but. He wasn't an easy person, let's be honest. And if you didn't get along with him and Hudson Doyle didn't seem to, then that is difficult. And I agree with you with Hazarding, but we didn't know if Hazard's leaving until very recently either, you know. I think, I think it was like quite a long time. I think well, everyone, we don't know how close within they were. the team, I'm pretty sure 
everyone knew. Like, Maybe let, if we felt long, honest, but... we didn't officially know, but we knew Hazard was leaving. Yeah, but Hazard himself, I think, said that he told the club about in March or April, right? Yeah, what yeah. his final decision was. So, when, like, so again, those are four months where we weren't sure if Hazard was staying or not. Mm. That, you know, December to March. I'm just saying, put it into context, give it time. I wouldn't slander him at the moment at all. I wouldn't slander him until he is in different, you know, di wearing a different shirt. And one should just take it into context. But I think we're running out of time here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're at 50 minutes in um, of the recording. I mean, I, I get, like I say, I, I get what you're saying. To me, it's just, he didn't initially, like he started against Spurs in that League mm. Cup, mm. you know, semi-final first leg. Mm. But then he actually didn't play for quite a while. You know, because the the City and Bournemouth defeats were after that. We took him to Bournemouth in the foot, and you know when we lost four 0 and he was set on the stand. So like you know that was all after that game and yeah. after transfer request. So he didn't actually start playing straight away. That was maybe a month or so later when he actually started to play late regularly. Yeah. So I don't think it's as easy as saying, oh yeah, we were clearly scared of Bayern, so now we started to play him. I, I think the way Sari spoke as well. Of course, you can never be certain how serious the manager is and how honest the manager is when they say something in an interview in a, in a press conference it felt like the way he spoke about it the way he started the way you know he used him it didn't feel like he was forced to use him to me it didn't feel like that um but it's just like you don't need to drag it out like that like i know he's he's young right fair enough but he doesn't act young so he doesn't get the excuses of being young because if you act like a 25-year-old that is better than Eden Hazard, apparently you don't get the excuses of being 18 either. You can't have it both ways. You can't have the good ways of both things, right? I'm being mature, but then when you're not mature, then, you know, you're only 18. Like, which is it then? Um, but also, you know, I understand the whole thing of being influenced by his family because his brother and dad seem to be slight problems, especially with their apparent, you know, sort of friction, like... Just friction between them and, and Marina Granovsky, I guess. Um, and him being injured, I'm sure, is also not easy because, you know, you're not around your team that much. You're not around, yeah. like, those people that make you love the football, make you love to be around the club mm. because you're with physios and at home, really. So I understand all of that. But it's just, I think, understandable that when reports come out, it's actually, we're not sure whether he can't, he's going to sign a contract. When those things come out, for someone that has already handed in a transfer request, I'm like, I, I don't trust you to, you know, do normal things here. Because I agree, I think he will probably sign a new contract. But if you asked me on January 10th, I would have guaranteed you that he's not going to hand in a transfer request. And then what happened? Like, you know. So much has happened since then, you know. I mean, oh, no, I, I, I understand, understand what you're saying. saying. I don't trust him on mm. that kind of decision. And then I'm saying, because knowing Chelsea, yeah, Will we really keep him until the end of the season if he tells us he will not sign a new contract on any circumstances? Just in theory. I, I know we both don't believe that that is the situation. But if he said that, I don't think we would keep him. I think we would go with Kennedy or whoever, or play whoever on the wing. I don't think we would keep him then. I just don't see that. So it's a completely new situation. We haven't had this France, well, completely new. I can remember the Kakuta situation. But, you know, we had a much, much more balanced and strong squad back then. And the thing is that right now, it's, a, it's going to be a year first. I've said this quite a few times. I don't know. I think in this situation, I could very much imagine them saying, yeah, we're staying even if you, you know, we, we can't, we, we yeah, don't get any cash for him. If he doesn't want but, to be here, would there be much point in that? Well, he, was, he didn't seem to be, want to be here in January. And when he did play, he was still playing good. You know, if, it's that, it depends yeah. on the mentality entirely. Yeah. So I think the thing is, First of all, we have to be patient. And second of all, we've done everything we can right now. And we and this is the most vital thing about this. We have no clue. We, we know that we know nothing. There are always reports this and that and this and that. We don't know for sure what's going on behind the scenes. You know, oh, have we given him the 10 shirt? We don't know. You know, have we given him 100K? We don't know. Is it really because of the friction between Mariana Granovskaya and his family? Even if we have gotten, you know, some in the know stuff, we can't say for sure because we haven't been sitting at that table. You know, yeah, information but if, but, all gets... Right. But if you talk about... Sorry to interrupt, but if you talk about football that way, you might as well never talk about transfers ever because then you just don't know until it's official. 
No, I'm just, I have a very big problem with the way uh, Callum hudson Adoy is currently being treated by a lot of people on Twitter or anywhere else. That's why I'm saying this, because there are people that are taking these reports for facts, and that is simply not true, yeah? And that is the point I'm trying to make, because we don't know, yeah? Of course you're right, then we don't have to talk. We love to talk about transfer rumors, and that is fine, but they are rumors, exactly that. Yeah, and nothing more. We have to wait and see. We can speculate. We can say, ah, oh, this seems more, more uh, likely or not. But, you know, saying we've given him this, we've said that, we've done that, as some big Chelsea accounts have actually been saying, that's not true. How do you know? You do and not know do. that. You know? Huh? Maybe they do know. I'm pretty confident that that's not the case uh, in all of those. You know, we'll see. We'll see. For example, wasn't there like an announcement that the Chelsea uh, Chelsea FC Twitter said there's going to be, you know, a watch out for the app later on today? Either it was just that Christian Pulisic video of him saying hi, or maybe I think so because they tweeted the picture of Pulisic, so it had to have done to do with Pulisic. And then that's a shame because I would have liked to have heard what his uh, number will be next season because I think if he were to get the number ten, then that would. Maybe have a bearing on, or not a bearing, but it that would be mean an indication. Yeah, you know, it could be an indication for more yeah. speculation. Let's, let's not forget that Ike Agba wore Callum Asnadoy's shirt number in the game against Bohemians. So course, yeah. you know, so the number the number ten shirt thing is not like completely far fetched. Someone else wore his number, so <laughs> the likelihood of him getting the other number then that is now free isn't exactly like, you know, it's, it's not like making complete things up here. And even the £100,000 number, we gave um, Mason Mount £77, £77,000. So then you have that slight step up mm. to up to hudson Doy to 100 k when Ruben is on 150 to be kind of in the middle of the two. Oh, it's yeah. completely logical. So it's not like these things are completely made up and like, no, maybe we actually only offered him 50000 I mean, we clearly didn't, did we now? No. So, you know, I, no, I understand what you're saying. What... I'm quintessentially trying to say here is that one isn't allowed to just say this is the way it is because we can't say for sure that it is that way. Yeah, it makes perfect sense that he will be getting 100k or we offered the 100k. It makes perfect sense that we will give him the 10, but we don't know for sure. But you know, as we already mentioned, and time is running out. Pulisic, he's here, brilliant. I think there's not much to say on that. It'll be exciting to see him on Friday, though. Yeah, that, that of course. And also, you know, you have to respect the fact that he cut his holiday short after just one, literally nine mm. days after the Gold Cup final. Yeah. Um, and already joining, you know, the, the squad in Japan, you know, flying from the USA straight to Japan to meet, to, you know, join up with the squad and mm. already training with the first team. You have to respect that dedication. Um, hopefully it goes well. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it, really. Yeah, me too. You know, I, I was critical at first, but he's shown, you know, right the right attitude. Uh, as you just said, he's been good in the last few months for Dortmund. He's been good for America or for the US. Sorry, um, bit exciting times. So this will conclude our episode for this week. Um, as Lawrence said, not quite at the start of the video, but uh, in the middle. Please do subscribe to the Attacking 2 podcast. Follow us on Twitter. Um, give us a good rating on iTunes. You can find us on YouTube, on Twitter, on iTunes, and Spotify, of course. We are still not sure if one can actually subscribe there, but if you can, please do. Um, and the next episode will be coming in the first week of August. We've got quite a few new things lined up and ideas that we want to implement. Uh, it will be a brand new image, one could say, uh, as Lawrence has joined the team and we want to change a few things because Andy's long in the past. Uh, no offence, Andy. Um, so, of course, there are lots of great things lined up for the attacking two. And that's all for us for now. I'll be gone for two weeks. Uh, if anything happens, do tell me. Thank you very much. And that's all. That's it. Yeah, up the chills and keep the blue flag flying high.